Hello, I'm Mark Ditzler. In this section, we will be learning about molecular evolution in the lab. Specifically, I will be telling you about a technique called in vitro evolution. In vitro evolution allows us to observe the evolution of molecules in a test tube. In vitro evolution has been used to study multiple types of molecules. It has been applied to proteins, to ribonucleic acids or RNA, and it has even been applied to a group of molecules that I'm referring to here as RNA-like. These RNA-like molecules are not observed in modern biology, but some of them may have relevance to the origin of life. Now, this method of in vitro evolution allows us to ask two very broad questions. One, what can these molecules do? And two, how can they evolve? I emphasize can here because in vitro evolution allows us to examine evolutionary processes independent of biology and its specific evolutionary history. So, how does in vitro evolution work? Well, in general, the first step is to generate an extremely diverse population of molecules. Experiments often start with something like 10 to the 15 different sequences of proteins, RNA, or RNA-like molecules. Now that's a whole lot of zeros, and that adds up to a tremendous amount of diversity. The next step is a selection step. This step depends on exactly what task we want to evolve the populations to perform. So we might decide we want to evolve RNA molecules that carry out a specific chemical reaction, or perhaps we want to evolve proteins that combine a specific small molecule. Whatever function we decide on, the key to making the experiment work is coming up with a clever way of physically separating the rare functional molecules from all the other non-functional molecules. There are several ways this can be done. I will not describe the details here, but you can find out about some of the tricks people use to do this by looking at the re recommended reading and references associated with this section. Now that we've isolated our functional molecules, we are going to throw away all the others and then take the surviving molecules and use a series of enzymatic steps to make many copies of them. In the process of making these copies, sometimes a mistake is made and we end up having a mutation in the population. Now we have several copies of the functional sequences and we even added a little extra diversity. An important consequence of having multiple copies is that if you repeat the selection step, you will generally isolate more copies of the better sequences and fewer copies of the worse sequences with better being determined by whatever function you're trying to evolve. For example, being better could mean the sequence is faster at carrying out a chemical reaction. In the next step, we once again use enzymes to make multiple copies of the isolated functional sequences. We can continue to repeat all of these steps several times until we end up with a population of molecules that is really good at accomplishing the function we decided to select for. So, just to summarize, we are generating diversity. We are then selecting fit individuals that have a certain function. Then we are making copies of the fit molecules, which is essentially generating offspring. And when we make these offspring, mutations are introduced and this results in more diversity for the next round. If we think of each round as a generation, you can see why we often call this evolution in a test tube. It's just that instead of a population of organisms evolving over time, it's a population of molecules evolving over time. Over the years, many labs have used in vitro evolution to address a wide variety of questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, many of these questions have to do with identifying what these molecules can do and how they can evolve. Now let's go through some specific examples of what people have learned from their in vitro evolution experiments. One thing that these experiments has revealed is how very simple proteins can carry out chemical reactions. We have also learned that RNA can catalyze many classes of chemical reactions. And RNA can bind a wide variety of other biomolecules. The RNA-like molecules I mentioned earlier can do many of the same things that RNA can do. In vitro evolution has shown us that proteins can fold into functional structures that are not observed in biology. 
In some cases, we have learned that highly active molecules with complex functions are extremely rare. It is also becoming increasingly apparent that neutral point mutations probably don't play as large a role in evolution of new structures and functions as we once thought. So, I think this should give you a good sense of what kinds of things we can learn from this technique. I have provided references for each of the specific examples listed here, and I've also included suggested reading on in vitro evolution in general.